Welcome to the Andy Social Podcast. My name's Andy, as always. Uh, thanks for tuning in. Uh, there's been a little bit of a gap with some of the episodes to date. Um, I'm not sure if you guys have noticed. I've tried to keep it fairly consistent, but um, I've gone from the uh, couple a week, or I think at one stage I was almost on three in a week or whatever it was, um, down to down to one a week again. Yeah, things are a bit, bit crazy at the moment. I'm uh, in the process of uh, finalizing all of the, uh, the last little... Uh, little niggly things that uh that are outstanding for our wedding which is coming up in at the end of august so uh it's um it's getting closer and closer so it's exciting but uh extremely stressful as well so uh there's been a lot of a lot of things going on uh, stuff with the band as well so we're still in the process of uh getting everything finalized for the us and we're going through the visa process which is yeah there's a little bit of stress behind it but uh but it will work out so it's fine so uh yeah i've uh, i've slowed down a little bit with the podcast but um i'm trying to keep it fairly consistent um also while uh i don't think i've had an opportunity to really sort of uh make a comment about uh about the podcast party that happened uh a few weeks ago in sydney so a massive thank you to everyone that uh that came out it was uh, it was really cool totally chilled out informal sort of uh do that we had where we just sort of hung out at the bar and and drank and just dribbled and 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 just uh talk shit for for a few hours and it was really cool and so a massive thanks to jordan at frankie's pizza for for uh, being so hospitable uh with the venue and uh thanks to everyone that came out it was really really cool and i'm gonna do a few more of these um well i'm gonna try and do more of these just long term so i think probably i'll I'll look to do another one later this year, um, depending on how everything falls. And I'm looking to do a few things interstate as well in other parts of Australia. So there's a few other things that I've got uh, lined up uh, probably over the next 12 months. Uh, so we'll see how that looks. And um, and then maybe uh, we can find some opportunities to uh, to extend this uh, further. So it's not just uh, the Sydney guys that uh, that we have a social do for. So, but um, anyway, a really massive thanks to everyone who came out. That was really, really cool. And uh, there'll be more, more coming soon in the future as well. Uh, anyway, moving on. The uh, guest for this week is Jake Skinner. So Jake, I've known for quite a few years. Uh, met him when our bands first uh, played together in Christchurch, going back seven or eight years. Um, and Jake's band at the time, uh, Disillusion, which is still around but currently on hiatus, um, is uh, is a really cool band. I'll put some links uh, to to the music as well, so you guys can check it out. But uh, Jake's uh, Jake's had an interesting path over the last few years, and um, he goes into detail in our, in our conversation, but uh, a lot of it sort of changed his uh, he's changed his mental approach um, and his outlook on life, and he's got heavily into uh, physical fitness. He's become a personal trainer um, and also discovered uh, flotation. And you guys, for anybody who's been listening to the podcast over however many months this has been going, uh, will probably know that um, I've got a keen interest in it, uh, but I've yet to dive into it. So it's um. It's something that um, I really need to pull my finger out and, and uh, step into it and give it a give it a go. So um, I'm hoping that I'll be able to tick that off the list in the in the coming weeks and and maybe just do a, a follow up episode on that because I think um, from I think for you guys who probably aren't terribly aware of flotation and, and float tanks. Uh, it, it probably sounds very, and I've mentioned this in the, in the conversation with Jake on the surface sounds very simple and probably non eventful and probably something that doesn't have a lot of benefit. But, uh, as, as you'll hear, there's so many facets to this that, uh, that can be so beneficial for the mind and body. And, um, I think for me, where, where I'm at in my life, I think it's probably something that I, I really need to experience and need to see whether it's something that I, that I should, uh, should really take advantage of. So we'll, we'll see where the future holds, but um, Jake spent a year in, in Canada um, and several of those months in that year uh, working at a flotation center. So he's had a lot of experience with floating um, and we talk about his experiences that he's had personally and also some of the stories from other people that have, uh, that have had benefits from, uh, from using flotation. Um, and we talk about fitness, just physical fitness and mental fitness, uh, you know, the body and mind being linked up together and the benefits of, of, uh, doing the right thing by yourself, whether that be, you know, physical movement and, you know, exercise, 
uh, mental approach and uh, your diet as well. We're speaking a little bit about diet also. Uh, a really cool episode. I'll put a links up for, for Jake uh, for his blog. He's also got a blog, um, his band. Um, and, and contact details so you can reach out and uh, have a chat to him. But he's a really cool guy, very inspiring because um, he is somebody that has changed significantly over the last few years uh, and um, is a great example of somebody who's just doing fantastic things. And uh, we, we need more people like this out there. So I um, really encourage you to, to reach out and just say a quick hello to him and, and let him know what, what you thought of the conversation. So anyway, enough uh, rambling, because I am very good at that. Uh, please enjoy this conversation with Jake. I think the big thing I was going to ask straight off the bat is, you're currently a personal trainer? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And how long have you been doing that for? I've been doing that for about, I don't know, how long have I been doing that for? At least a bit, but three years now, actually. And um, and there's been a bit of a journey over the last three years, which will we'll no doubt have a chat about as, as we go. But, um, I'm curious yeah. as to, cause when I first met you and this is going back a few years now, I certainly didn't, uh, didn't envision you to be a personal trainer and, uh, be heavily into the whole fitness world and, and all the other things that you've been doing over the last few years. So what, what was the change? Was there something that happened that sort of got you didn't, into this, uh, well, the industry itself, but even just for yourself personally? Well, essentially, uh, what got me into it was, um, Really, my health. My health was really going downhill. Um, I was uh, I was in hospitality industry at the time, so I worked full time as a chef. Um, and there's obviously a lot of hospitality parties and plenty of free alcohol. So <laughs> that, it's always fun, right? And that's everyone's dream. But um, essentially, my health started going downhill, and I started noticing it um, quite badly. So um, I. I, I think my girlfriend at the time was uh, going to this little small gym in town and um, I decided to tag along for one of the workouts. And um, essentially I just got on the rower and absolutely smashed myself. <laughs> <laughs> and um, and I felt the endorphin rush yep. that uh, I think a lot of people feel when they first do it. And, um, and then that's where the journey really started, man. Like I really got into it and really started connecting um, the mind and body a lot more. Um, and it helps with my creativity with writing and everything as well. So it's super cool. What, um, I mean, I've, I've attempted to go to the gym multiple times and sometimes I've stayed longer than, than other stints in the past. But I mean, was it really that instant that you really sort of, it, it just something clicked straight away or was it something that you really had to push yourself initially, just at least a few visits or a few goes or over a period of weeks to, until it really started to bed in? Or was it, was it really something that was a bit of an epiphany at the time where you went, this is, this is what I need to do. And, or you were in that, yeah. that much of a position where you just, you felt like you had no choice. You just had to make that change. Well, essentially it was an epiphany. Yeah. So, um, it, it wasn't like, it wasn't like I was forced to make a change or anything like that. There was no real catalyst as such, but apart from feeling ill and drowsy and shitty all the time, right? So, um, yeah, so essentially um, there was an epiphany that I just went straight ahead with, and, and it wasn't hard. Like, it was a switch. It definitely was a switch. Yeah, amazing. It's um, yeah. I, I, That's something that I'm really envious of because I've gone – I've gone to the gym in the past and I've had gym memberships and I think for the first several weeks of going, it's a case of there's a bit of motivation there and there's the vision of, of being healthy and, and, and mentally and physically and, and all the benefits that come from it. And, but you still have to push yourself a little bit. And then after a while, it's like, oh, well, I can't go today because of this. And then before you know it, it's mm. there's three or four visits in a row that you haven't been able to make it. It's like, oh, well, I'll get back to it soon. And then eventually you cancel and get your membership out um, as a result of it. But and there's a lot of people that go through those challenges and it's very difficult to stay disciplined. So mm. it's, it's quite uh, it's quite cool to, to know that it, it was something for you that was just like it was there was a click there and it just it made sense and, and, uh, and you just stuck to it. And it was something that obviously was – was motivating in itself. So that's, I mean, I'm completely en envious of you that uh, that's worked so easily for you. Yeah, well, I mean, it doesn't go without its challenges because mm. uh, when when you go to the gym, like you say, you might miss a couple of days. Um, and then you've got to battle with those thoughts of like, you know, um, oh, you're lazy. You know, oh, you should just go do it. Mm. You know, like, a, but 
But what I've realized now is that um, when you're more aware of like what those thoughts are telling you, you sort of have to be, you have to listen to those as well because you'll get the weekend warrior who um, goes to the gym every day and just goes hard, mm. you know what I mean? And that's like there's only so much willpower that you can burn through mm. before you're not going to the gym anymore. Yeah. So yeah. I always tell my clients that, you know, like if you're feeling good, you know, make sure you get your rest days in, make sure that you're on a long-term journey and not a short-term fix. Yeah. And, and people, yeah, they really, um, they have to be in tune with those thoughts because you can beat yourself up, man, just for missing one session. But it's it's not going to do anything good for you, you know? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And I, I think just touching on, you know, the motivation side of things, like you said, you, I think people probably don't realize and probably put a lot of pressure on themselves with, with motivation, thinking that they've got to constantly be motivated all the time and in that right frame of mind. But you really, I, I can't remember who it was, but I remember listening to something where uh, someone was talking about your levels of motivation and that most people will have only so much fuel in the day to be motivated in a particular mindset. And then after that, you just can't maintain it. So I think people need to be aware of that and, and understand, like, for instance, you know, in a very basic way of explaining it, the first half of a day in the morning for some people, that's when your mind's more switched on and you can be more uh, active and productive and motivated, but you can't maintain that for, for the entire day. So people do a lot of uh, creative things and a lot of things that involve a lot of mental power in the mornings and in the afternoon switch to something that's a little bit less, uh, less mentally intensive. So it's, um, Absolutely. yeah. So I think a lot of people don't realize that and then they kick themselves when, you know, when it comes to, you know, say after work and they can't uh, find the motivation to, to pop into the gym on the way home from, from uh, yeah, you know, slaving away tough. all day. Yeah, um, but also I'd like to point out that, um, like you say about that, that motivation, um, a lot of people have a lot of pressure on themselves as well to look a certain way, mm. to like um, to, to be a certain way. And, and I find that, that that pressure can crush people in the first couple of weeks of going to a gym, right? Because mm, mm. all it takes is that envy to take over, you know, of like, oh, she's got a better butt than me or whatever, you know? <laughs> like, that guy's got bigger biceps than me, you know? And, and, and people get really caught up on that and um, it crushes them. Do you find that a lot of people that come to you that you see are going, what's the ratio of, of people going for the purpose of the aesthetics of looking good versus the, the internal mental and physical uh, well-being? Well, essentially, um, it's probably 0% aesthetic, man. Like yeah. the most, most of the people I attract are people that are looking for a life change mm. and are looking to just move better and have no pain. Mm. So essentially, and the aesthetics come with that. Yeah. So so it's not a it's not an emphasis in what I offer people. Mm. I always make sure people can move correctly and they can do things correctly so they're not injuring themselves, so they can sustain this for a long term. Well, you probably find yeah. that the people that uh, probably focus more on the aesthetics of how they look are the people that probably wouldn't invest in a personal trainer and just go to the gym, just walk in and just start picking up stuff or just throwing themselves on a treadmill and – and, uh, mm. and and probably not lasting the distance, not having the the longevity of uh, sticking to it, uh, because they're there for the wrong reasons. And as you said, they probably haven't uh, got the right movement. They're not using utilizing the the facilities the way that they should for their benefit. So I guess when it comes to personal training, people are making that investment and probably a lot more serious with their approach, um, wanting to you know obviously improve themselves physically, you know not not so much from the outside but the inside out. Absolutely. And then obviously the, the benefit or the side effect of that is that, you know, the aesthetics uh, eventually kick in over time. But I guess you'd probably find that initially with a lot of people, as you said, when they're starting a program and just kicking into it, that there's probably a bit of frustration that they might not be seeing a great deal of results initially. Mm. Or they do see, I think, well, this is my uh, uneducated uh, <laughs> comments coming through, but I think for a lot of people, they probably see an initial uh, impact from what they're doing. So they might see a little bit of weight loss or some, some initial, uh, stuff that they can see in the mirror. But then I think after that probably plateaus out of, for, for quite a while before they see those results. Yeah. And it's hard for people to hold on to that because, um, they have this such high expectations on themselves mm. and, um, and that's, that's rough. That's stressful in itself. Right. Yeah. Like, 
yeah, how can you sustain that amount of stress for that amount of time? So the idea is to really make sure that it's not stressful for someone and it's fun. Stop sort of trying to measure up to other people. Yeah. And it's really the, just do your own journey. Yeah. Get what you can out of it. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And is it something like with, when you deal with your clients, for, for the people that are probably trying to find an, or get an understanding of where the improvements are coming from to, to try and measure it. Cause a lot of people I think that aren't terribly versed with fitness would probably just assume that they need to look in the mirror to be able to see that things, things are working when that's not always the case. So mm. I assume that you probably have some other things that you can use to demonstrate that, that yeah, there are, there are results happening, even though you might not see them straight away. Well, essentially, um, you can do measurements and so forth. I'm not really a huge fan of weight, although it is yeah. a good baseline indicator of how someone's doing. But BMI is a bit of a joke. But uh, essentially, um, uh, measurements are much better. Yeah. Um, but I also question people, you know, like, so how you been lately? Like, how how you been feeling lately? You know, like, um, has you, have your days been effortless? Have you had great weeks? Have you been feeling happy, you know, like, and the majority of these people, like, are, are much, you know, they can handle the stresses in their life much easier. And that, to me, is a huge part of it. Mm. Like, it's not always about that mirror, because that mirror will change over time. Yeah. But um, your mind is always changing. So, yeah, it's it's definitely to strengthen the mind as well. It's definitely all linked together, and I think a lot of people forget that or just don't realize it. And, um, I think, I think now it's probably a lot, there's a lot more awareness around the link between body and mind than, than it has in the past. Um, but, uh, there's definitely, I think for me now, when I eventually find the motivation to kick back into, into, uh, you know, physical fitness again, the benefits are, um, for me are more so the mind than not just the body. I think in the past I've gone in with the intention of just physically feeling better, but not thinking that it's got a link to the mind. And I think now the things that I want to do in, in life and thinking about being motivated and productive and getting things done, a lot of that's got to come from how I feel physically. So in order to be in the right mindset, I've got to make sure that my body is in the right, in the right uh, position as well. Yeah. And we all, we all struggle with that sort of balance. Um, like I'm, I'm human as well, and I, I definitely go through stages where, you know, if I'm not doing enough physical activity or enough exertion, if I miss a couple of BJJ classes or something like that, um, I just notice this, this feeling, you know, I'm like, oh, but, but sludgy, you know. Yeah. <laughs> so, so when I hit the, you know, when I hit a high octane workout or something like that, I'm just, I'm back, you know, I'm charged back up, I'm ready to rock, you know, and um, and people can definitely benefit from just, you know, slotting that in. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And I think the, the discipline thing is such a hard thing for people. I think for most people anyway, I mean, there's people that are like yourself that are, that are quite lucky that I think right time, right place. And it's just, everything's fall like mentally sort of falling into place initially to get you going. Um, but for a lot of mm. people, it's that, that, that initial discipline, but then the long-term discipline as well, which is, which is a difficult thing. But on that, on that topic, and I think, um, I'm not sure whether you'll be able, you might not be the best example because you've, uh, you've got that motivation, but um, being in Christchurch and even when you're in Canada as well, and we'll talk about that uh, shortly as well, you're in extremely cold climates. And I think at least from my experiences in the summer months, everyone's a lot more proactive to exercise and get out there and be physically fit. But when it comes to the winter months, I think that's when people slip and people start eating a lot more. They're, they're rugging up, they're sitting at home, they're not doing a great deal of physical exercise. Um, yeah. but, but given where you are in Christchurch, I mean, I think even your summers aren't, I mean, you might have a few few really hot days, but I think that probably the ratio over the year is that it's more or less reasonably cold. What's the, yeah. what sort of motivate, apart from, you know, obviously going to a gym and, and working indoors, what sort of motivation is there to kick keep it going over those winter months, especially now it'd be pretty, pretty cold over your side now. Yeah. So, um, for me personally, I'm very lucky to be sort of in the journey of uh, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu at the moment because you get to wear a gi and it's super, super warm. Yeah. Um, you know, the whole dojo is roasting, so it's like a sauna. Mm. Um, and, and that to me is, uh, a lot more inviting in winter. Mm. So, um, so that for me is a huge motivation to still train yeah. um, in the winter. Yeah. Um, and essentially, you know, like, I don't think it's too much of an issue because, you know, I have my motivation days that are low. 
But, um, you know, going to a class or something like that, for most of the general public, is a lot more inviting because you're getting warm, mm. you know what I mean, by moving. Yeah. But it's just that initial, um, the, the morning people, like I struggle with this myself, is, um, you know, the, the early morning workouts. Mm. Huh, that's tough. That's yeah. real tough. It has to, it has to be an afternoon type thing, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Mm. But, then, but then when you look at that, bro, yeah. when, you, when you really look at the winter thing, you know how you say hibernation, sort of, you know, like warmth and comfort and all that thing. Perhaps it is a sort of time to back off a little bit and rest and focus on other things, you know? Well, it might be something where probably in the, in that period of time where people are slowing down a little bit, it's probably more of a focus on, well, it should always be a focus on diet, but I think probably even more of a focus of diet in that period of time when you're, when you're less active. Yeah, exactly. And it, it's super hard. Like mm. it's not all, it's not all easy. And it's about finding what's right for you because some people eat certain foods in winter and, um, and others gain heaps of weight. Um, but, um, and some others don't. So it's, it's always a little play with food really. Yeah. Yeah. Every, there's, everyone's got a, their own individual path, uh, and everyone reacts differently to, to their set, set of circumstances and, and whatever they're putting in, in their stomachs as well. So, uh, yeah, absolutely. And, and, and- and also the emotional makeup of that person, you know, like someone might be so stressed out, you know, have so many things on their plate and not even realize it. And then realizing that that's sucking their power, their willpower to actually hit the gym. So um, there's a lot of factors to it. Eh? It's amazing. Yeah, it's. It, I think it's a lot more complex is probably not the, the best word to put uh, to, to describe it, but it is a lot more complex than probably people think. But it's not complex in the sense that it's difficult. It's just that there's a lot more to it than just you know, getting up and, and moving your body and that's it. There's a, there's a lot of factors that you have to keep in mind. And I think when the, especially in the nineties, I've noticed that um, I'm not sure if it was like that over, over your way as well, but there was a massive focus on just diets and, the, mm. and, and I think that that industry really sort of milked it. And a lot of people, you know, I've had family members that would just take the next crazy diet that came along and just expect that their world would change, but they would suffer with this diet, they would just yeah. they'd sacrifice so much. And then but the big question was always, okay, well, when your diet's over for your six weeks or whatever it is, what do you do after that? You know, <laughs> you can't, you can't maintain that, that crazy diet that you're on. So what do you do after that? No. And, and they just go back to what they were eating beforehand. So it was, um, yeah. and I think now, at least from, from the outside, it appears that the diets are still there and people are still still using those options but i think it's i think people have got a bit more uh i think people got a little bit more educated now and i think probably with the internet and whatnot people are seeing what other other people are up to and can see that there's more options out there and and you have to be a little bit smarter about your your approach and it it doesn't have to be difficult there's a lot of factors to it but it doesn't have to be difficult yeah absolutely i mean there's so many so many factors to those diets and um i'm I'm not a big fan of them like uh, i think they're all like the next big thing, they're just out there to sell and make money. And in a capitalist society, that's you know you're going to make money off everything, right? Mm. So um, when it comes down to um, diet, um, essentially a well balanced all round diet is always the best way to go mm. because it's way more sustainable. Yeah. And um, sustainability is what it's all about, and integration. Mm. Because when people come off diets, they've got ruined metabolisms. Yeah. And they'll just gain it all back and worse. And then you're ruining that person's like mentality for even trying again, mm. which is disgusting, you know? Yeah. Yeah. It yeah, definitely not a big fan. <laughs> no, absolutely. And it does a it, it does a lot of damage mentally for people as well, because I I've seen it where people continue continuously try different diets and they just get shattered every every time that they that the results come back and they find themselves blowing back up to what they were beforehand. They just say nothing ever works. And it's just yeah. the, the completely wrong approach. Um, just on the topic of that really quickly, what's, um, I don't know a lot about it, but what's your thoughts on all these detox treatments that are out there? So people that do like just an all juice detox for, you know, a week or a few weeks or whatever it might be. Um, wh- is there, is there benefit to those things? Or do you think that it's sort of another, another, a masked, another masked diet that's out there that really, I mean, you have to just maintain a well-balanced diet, as you said before. Um, well, I, I think it's a little bit of a money maker yeah. as well, but I, I think there is benefit to um, detox and as such, uh, but, but via fasting. Um, so fasting is probably the best way to detox the body. Mm. 
Um, but not, but not so much uh, like the special juice. You know, like I mean, juice is a fantastic, and I love drinking juice, man. But you're essentially taking a lot of fiber out as well, mm. which is um, you need that fiber, man. That's yeah. important. And um, but yeah, don't get me wrong, I really enjoy the juices and that, but I'd never do a juice diet. You know, like all the way through. Mm. Mm. Like I just, I just don't. It's not around. It's not balanced. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. But, but yeah, I think it is another money ploy in a way. Yeah. Um, it, it can obviously you can get a lot more phytonutrients and so forth in in a quick way, which is which is positive, you know. But um, as for detox diets, you know, ones that are like two to three weeks long, and you know, you only have this much amount of fluid, and oh, it's 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 freaky, man. Yeah, I mean, it's uh, the way that I I see it is, I mean, they they market it as a detox, making in other words, it they're really sort of emphasizing that's a short-term thing that you're doing. Um, and it's meant to sort of, I guess, well, from my perspective, it seems to be like a bit of a reset in a way. Um, yeah. But I can, I worry that, I mean, not that I've had, it, had any interest in it myself, but I've always worried that what, what state your body is in after you've gone through that process and, you know, what, where you're at and, you know, you might be, you might feel a little bit lighter and a little bit, uh, cleansed in in certain aspects but i mean what's that as you said before what's that do to your metabolism when you start eating going back to your your existing diet again so it's um, absolutely yeah yeah and on yeah the- um, it's always interesting how that works though like because metabolism is like such an important thing mm. and if you stop eating solids as such <laughs> your metabolism will change yeah big time yeah yeah because yeah. um i think even with uh well, with metabolism. Well, actually, going back to what you said before about fasting, what would what would that do to your metabolism? I, I, mean, I mean, it depends on how long you you fast for. I assume. Well, look at Ramadan. Yeah. They, so they they fast for a, a quite a long time, and they sip broth mm. uh, during the day, right? And they really restrict their water and everything. Mm. And um, like it can be a super beneficial thing to reset sort of the organs and make sure they're all talking to each other correctly. Um, I think that's the main sort of thing about it as well and also a discipline yeah um but essentially i mean metabolism wise like there's you know you've heard of intermittent fasting and so forth people getting great results by using that um metabolism doesn't seem to be super affected by it but um but yeah i mean it's giving your body a chance to rest yeah um because it's always digesting yeah. it's always doing something yeah and most of the time for most people, it's digesting stuff that it probably shouldn't be digesting either. Uh, <laughs> exactly, so, yeah. So it's working, it's working overtime to try and get all this crap through your system and a lot of it's just not, not coming out at all, which obviously that's where, where people start to, to balloon out. So, uh, yeah, I, I, understand, yeah. I understand a bit of the concept and it's, it's something that's kind of – it is interesting because I, I like the idea of that, that bit of a reset in a sense, but um, – I, when people talk about, I mean, I've seen it, people I work with and they go on these, these juice diets and I just look at it and I go, I can't, I can't imagine how liquid, a liquid only diet, regardless of whatever it is, uh, can, can give you any long-term benefits at all. Uh, you know, might give you some initial short-term, uh, short-term thrill mentally that, uh, you're doing something that you think is positive, but, um, physically I'm not, yeah, I, I don't. I couldn't get my head around it, but the fasting thing, depending on how long it goes for, is um, it, it makes a little bit more sense. But um, I think it was something I have to look into a bit further. Yeah, yeah, you definitely should. It's um, it's all very fascinating, and it's been used for thousands of years. So you know, if something's been used that long, it's usually quite beneficial. <laughs> well, yeah, absolutely. And I think I think uh, you know, probably a lot of the opinions out there we're we're based on our own experiences. And you know, for for most of us, we've only been on this planet for you know a few decades, if that. So you know, um, yeah, I think yeah, we yeah. probably need to need to go back and see what what the previous generations have been doing. And if and as you said, if something's been consistent along the way and it's it's proven to work, then yeah, there must be there must be something right there. Yeah, it must be some sort of essence to it that's correct, you know? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, touching on, I mentioned before, you are in Canada for how long were you over there for? I was over there for a year on a working holiday visa. Yeah. And yeah. I, I noticed, and, and this is, I think, was sort of sparked us talking, talking again after quite a while, is uh, you worked at a, a flotation centre? 
Yeah, yeah, I did. I worked at uh, Float House Victoria. And, and you did that for the, the entire 12 months that you were there? Well, it would have been, well, let's see. So I arrived in September, and I had my very first flotation experience in November, the start of November. And then I started sort of asking, yeah, I could probably do some volunteering here mm. and just, you know, doing a four-and-a-half-hour shift for a free float every week. Right. And I essentially just worked in hospitality for a bit at a really cool place called Ferris Lucifer. It's pretty fun. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I did that, and then eventually there was a full-time position that sort of came up, and I took that. That's cool. Yeah. I, the whole flotation thing is something that I still haven't done because I'm lazy, but I've got yeah. so much fascination <laughs> with it. It's just, How could you be lazy, though? Uh, <laughs> lazy because floating so easy. <laughs> well, that's right. I mean, you know, once I'm there, then it's perfect. I just don't have to do anything. But um, it's yeah. it's something that I'm extremely fascinated about, and, um, and I think that's sort of what sparked us um, chatting a bit more um, over the last several months. But... For you, I mean, you said that you were there for a few months before you did your first float. Was it something that you were yeah. aware of that it, that it existed before you even got over to, to Canada or was it something that while you were there that somebody had introduced you to the concept and then you went and tried it out? Well, actually, um, I was turned on to it by um, a friend of mine, a very good friend of mine, um, Holger, mm-hmm. and uh, it was back in Christchurch and he mentioned that he was, you know, doing the odd float every now and again up in New Plymouth, which is quite interesting. Mm. And um, he talked about it a little bit, and then I guess there was a little tiny seed planted there. And then I saw Joe Rogan stuff yeah. on um, flotation and the benefits and and all that kind of thing. And, and then that sort of, that was the, the background as in, uh, I need to get into this. Mm. I need to find out more about this. Yeah. So I guess for anybody that's uh, not aware or doesn't understand what what floating or flotation is do you want to give a quick uh crash course in what it is especially now that you've you've officially worked in the industry yeah yeah um so essentially you're getting into a pot of water that is um super saturated salt water magnesium sulfate so it's just holy for magnesium that you can absorb um and you you sort of float effortlessly on top of this water this um and it's heated to skin temperature so you sort of lose the perception of uh, where the water starts and where your skin starts. So it's um, and you're just able to completely relax and anti gravity, and you sort of cut all the the senses out as such. So you've got like no smell, you've got um, yeah, no light, and also you lose that perception of feeling your skin as well. So you can really turn it inward and sort of focus on that on sort of processing thoughts and so forth. But yeah, essentially that's the experience. So you just float in there for you know sixty to ninety minutes. And um, and you come out essentially with a reset nervous system, mm. and you just feel super relaxed, and like tension leaves the body just so effortlessly. Um, it's a super, it's an amazing tool. I mean, obviously, it's got benefits for for anybody. Um, but is there yeah, is yeah, there yeah. certain is there certain types of people that it probably has an even bigger impact for? So people that have probably got uh, I'm just assuming probably uh, muscle pain or have had injuries or something like that where there's been a lot of pressure on their body for for whatever you know some some sort of trauma would that would that yeah. process of flotation probably have some larger impacts for people like that yeah we've had uh, one of our clients currently here in Christchurch um, he's had terrible back issues um, so back su- multiple back surgeries and um, he's always in pain um, so and that's even with the painkillers mm. <laughs> so he's in we get people like that and he's actually started he started floating like once a week mm. and uh, essentially he's now 30 days plus pain free wow um so you know, like he's he's on a less um, less pharmaceuticals. Everything's like relaxed, um, and he's getting a super amazing benefit from it. Not only just the the lack of pain, like he's getting like creativity possibilities. He's getting you know his mind just works a lot better. <laughs> mm. It's just amazing to watch, and his whole demeanor's changed. Yeah. So he used to be quite a uptight, cynical, very stressed person, and then essentially, yeah, it sort of just melted away. And it's amazing to watch on the physical side of it. And I mean, the mental side for me is where I, I'm really fascinated with it, but on the physical side of it with the, for that particular guy, is it probably a case that 
in that period of time that he is floating, that that aspect of his body that's had some trauma is just having a chance to, well, essentially heal without any pressure put on on it. Is that is that potentially a reason why he's able to go without? Like th- that's the results that he's getting is because his his body's suspended. He's not having any pressure on any aspect of his body, especially around that area. Absolutely. I mean, having that whole anti-gravity thing, we're mm. fighting gravity all the time. And when you get that chance to not fight gravity, it's pretty damn good for the body. I mean, you get that good endorphin release, you know, your body's just just healing itself, essentially. Well, it's probably, there's probably nothing else that would have that same sensation. I mean, even like if you're just sitting at home, like you're lying in bed, you're still pressed against the bed. So they're still, yeah. they're still pushing the gravity there downwards. And, and, you know, a lot of people probably don't sleep on, on a very good mattress either. Um, and then, you know, if they're in a bathtub, you still, you still, I mean, you might be floating depending on the size of your bathtub, but it's probably still that gravity there. That's not quite completely relaxing your body. So there's probably nothing else like it. No, there isn't. I mean, a lot of people say this is the most common thing, and it's so funny. You get people saying like, oh, I could just do that at home. (laughs) I'm like, oh, your bath would explode probably from the density of the salt to start with. (laughs) (laughs) Um, And then also you've got the fact of uh, distractions all around you, you know, so someone might be boiling the kettle. Mm. You know, we absorb all these things. We absorb all these sounds, and our brain's constantly processing Mm. all the time. Mm. So when we actually get that chance to switch everything off, um, yeah, it's it's an amazing sort of a liberating experience because, oh, my God, there's no sound. This is crazy. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's, yeah. Um, yeah, and I, this, is where, this is where I get really fascinated about it because I've, I've yet to experience it, but I've, I love the idea of being able to be in an environment that has no distraction, has nothing interfering with whatever's currently happening. And I guess... You know, I've attempted to to try meditation and things like that over over the last 12, 18 months. And at yep. times, I'm, it's better than other other times. And you know, you acknowledge sounds around you as they pop up, pop into your consciousness, and you don't fight it and whatnot. And it's that sort of being mindful mm. and whatnot. But um, but uh, in in a float in a float environment where you don't have those noises, you don't have that those distractions there that are just fighting for attention all the time. Um, I'm 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 curious to to think where your mind goes. Like what what like even from your first experience when you did do the float, and I think from what I've read and listened to from other people, it usually takes a few floats where you really start to to get those benefits mentally and physically. But from that first experience that you had, what what went through your head? What what sort of experiences were you getting? Well, well, I'm sort of in the same boat as you. Like I sort of got into meditation in a big way. The whole mindfulness practice, and uh, I've done a couple. I've done a ten day retreat as well for for Pasana retreat, and that also gave me the skills to sort of meditate. Uh, forcing yourself into that situation was quite good, but like this, the float tank essentially for me the very first time was really awkward. <laughs> I was like, got in the fold, and I was like, man, this is so weird. <laughs> and um, and I just started noticing how much I wanted to control my experience. Mm. Uh, mentally yeah so i was like right i hope this is okay this is gonna be okay but my first float i got in um and fully managed to relax the whole body mm. so then your body's my body was no longer a distraction mm. um for these thoughts that were flowing but i had like a whole range of thoughts happening you know like um it could have been just silly little minute stuff that's been happening during the week um it started on a superficial level of like, oh, yeah, that, I should have handled that situation better. Mm. <laughs> you know what I mean? You can start analyzing and start looking at, you know, parts of how you communicate with other people. Um, and then also it got on a deeper level, a level of like um, some of the blockages that I have in my life. And this is in my first float, mm. mainly because of my meditation background. Yeah. So I was able to sort of get into that pretty quickly. But um, essentially, I actually started getting really nauseous. Um, because the middle ear gets super confused with the whole um, anti-gravity element. Mm. And um, this doesn't happen to a lot of people, but it does happen to, the, you know, say one in one in 20 or something like that. Yeah. It's, it's not very common, but for me, taking gravity away made my middle ear super confused whether I was um, standing up, mm. lying down, 
Um, and then I started feeling like I was doing backflips in the tank. So, yeah, so I started getting nauseous from that. And that was like a, the sense of vertigo. Um, yeah. But essentially, um, and I also suffered from um, claustrophobia um, before I got into this float. So having the idea of being in water in an enclosed space uh, with no light mm. was uh, quite panicking for me to start with. Um, but I knew it would be a good sort of a good challenge because I love a good challenge. So getting in and doing that, I felt that after about, you know, 10, 20 minutes, I just started getting that feeling of like, I should open that damn lid <laughs> because, you know, it, it was just in the mind, yeah, you know, like yeah. it was just sitting there going, open that damn lid mm. and, and started, you know, breathing into my chest more, getting a bit anxious about it. And then I remembered sort of like the technique of meditation is don't be reactive, mm. you know, like don't attach yourself to that thought and follow it down the rabbit hole. So, Essentially, I just let myself relax more. I breathed deep into my belly, and then the thought passed. And then I didn't have that feeling ever again since I floated. So that first float was pretty intense. It was almost like a rite of passage for me. It was pretty intense. Yeah, a whole whole range of twists and turns throughout that whole whole period of time. And did were you in there for an hour or an hour and a half for that first one? It was an hour and a half. Yeah. And yeah, but you, but you lose that psychological time. Yeah, that's like, what you I'm don't even ask, know yeah. it's that long. Yeah, yeah. So it goes Which really cool. Qu- because, goes, goes a hell of a lot quicker than it feels like it goes quicker. Yeah, I mean, like the majority of clients that that get out of the tank, they feel like it, it was five minutes long. <laughs> you know what I mean? And they've been in there for a good amount of time, mm. and um, it's amazing to watch people go into that theta state where they're they're just just chilling it's really great to see because especially here in Christchurch we've got so many stressed people and there's so many traumas that the earthquake brought up mm. that um, people now have the opportunity to relax and then go possibly go see a counsellor afterwards you know and really integrate those problems uh, that's interesting because uh, I, I think PTSD would be well you just you just said it right there from from everything that's happened sort of in in the recent years in Christchurch with the, with the earthquakes, I mean, there'd be a hell of a lot of PTSD um, in, in the local local community there. So a resource like this would be so beneficial for people to, to be able to deconstruct their, their thoughts and their anxiety and, and be able to get to a point at least to then, as you said, seek some, seek some further help or some further counseling. Cause I think a lot of people would probably just, just continue to bottle it up and just struggle to struggle to control it. I mean, absolutely. I mean, I mean, I'm also the kind of person that's very open to, um, I've had counseling myself and, um, because we lost a friend in the quake. So it was, um, and that was something that I was bottling up for a bit. And then when you start noticing, um, when you have fantastic tools like this, you can actually float and then you're in a much better state to talk about these things and decompress yourself. So, and integrate all those feelings and, and, and issues that you may have that are causing massive blocks in your life. So, um, yeah, it's a fantastic tool for it. They both work well together. It's, uh, it's, um, it's funny because the concepts when, when people, people who don't understand it and they, they hear it for the first time, it sounds so one dimensional. And I think for a lot of people probably sounds a bit too woo woo or a bit too, um, uh, a bit too bullshit to be honest. And I think people who, who don't understand it, but, um, when you break it down, I mean, and we're only scraping the surface of it, just talking about it now, but there's just so many things that it could provide for people, uh, you know, just personally for individuals, but then I guess has a role on effect to the, to the wider community of, of, how everyone interacts with each other and their approaches and, you know, as I said before, creativity and, and motivation and just, I guess that positive thinking or just not so much positive thinking, but I guess just having the awareness and the acceptance of, of, uh, of life's uh, everyday challenges. Awareness is a massive thing. And that's something that um, I've, I've learned a lot about and becoming aware of those thoughts before you, you play them out, you know, mm. like, cause our society and social media is a fantastic example for this mm. is, um, it's like a little test, you know, you can see people trying to rock each other up mm. and essentially you've got a, a population of people that are super reactive. Um, so they're, they're acting impulsively on their thoughts, but when you do something like this, it enables you to sit back and observe and, and be a lot more selective and what battles that you you put yourself forward in, 
And I think if we had a society of people that were more, you know, less reactive and a lot more rational about what they're saying and not reacting on pure emotion, um, yeah, we'd have a much better existence. Mm. Oh, absolutely. Well, in Christchurch itself, it, how many how many float places are there? Is there just, just the one or is there a couple there that are in Christchurch? Um, there's one called Deep Space, um, and that's out in Lowburn. Mm-hmm. So that's just a one, I think it's a one tank um, set up. Mm-hmm. And there's another one open up in uh, Rangiora, um, and that's going to be a one tank set up too. But they're sort of like further out of town. Okay. Um, and essentially in town, we're the only ones at uh, Cloud9 Float Club down Mandeville Street, mm. which is um, actually the only one in town. So we we're very busy. It's very good. <laughs> yeah, very cool. that's one thing that I've noticed that um, the ones that are around, especially here in Sydney, and there's more and more popping up now and, and creeping down the south coast, is that most of the places are one tank set up. There's one place that's sort of more towards the city where there's a couple of tanks, but you look at their bookings and they're booked out way in advance. So you can definitely see that I think the the demand is is exceeding, you know, the supply at the moment. So there's definitely opportunity out there for people who want to start a business because I tell you what, it's, um, it's probably probably a very smart move to jump into that industry. But I think that's probably, that was probably one of the deterrents for me initially. It was like, okay, well, let's do this. And I looked and then it's like, oh, geez, it's going to take me weeks to, to get into a, get a slot in. Um but uh, it's just interesting to see how prevalent it is, you know, where we so are the only in issue, part of the world. Yeah, the only issue I have with that is, um, you know, a whole bunch of people starting our float centers who haven't really floated much. <laughs> Absolutely. You know what I mean? And yeah. It, yeah. And they don't get the under, they don't quite understand the depths of this technology that they have. Um, and, you know, the ability to hold space for people that are going into an environment like that is super important. Um, people can come out of the tank crying, mm. like happy tears. Mm. They could be happy that they've finally, you know, made peace with a situation in, um, in their minds, you know, like whether it's a past loved one or, you know, everyone's had their, had their things happen in their life. Yeah. So having a person there that can hold space and really um, allow them and support them, you know, just for the, before they jump out into the world again. Absolutely. And there's a place that's um, just south of Sydney in Wollongong. I think it's uh, they've only just moved, but um, I haven't been there. But a friend, a friend's been there, and uh, from my understanding, their setup is um, in, in an environment where you sit down and you relax before you even go into the float float tank. And so you sort of start to get into a relaxed state by chilling out, having a conversation with the people that work there and just getting relaxed. So you're not going in their tent straight away, but then also, which ties in with what you just said, once it's over and they come out, then they encourage you to sit back down in their little foyer, which is where they've got this nice setup and it's a nice environment. And then they just, you're there to have conversation and have a chat. So, it's, you know, it could be a long process and in quite a bit of time invested, but to be able to, to cap off that experience by having that sort of relaxed uh, ending to, to that experience would probably be so beneficial just for instances, just like you said before, where people aren't going from one extreme to the other. And it's, it's probably shocking the system and they're not having that opportunity to really express what they've just experienced. Yeah, the integrations are so important because <clears throat> one of the, one of the things is that um, you know if people get out into like rush hour traffic and like you know start feeling the tension again, mm. you know like they can um, essentially you've got to try and make sure that they're they're grounded and back again mm. because um, you can feel a bit floaty for a bit, you know. I mean, it's not unsafe to drive. I mean, you're not going to have any road rage. <laughs> you're always pretty you're always pretty chill i mean i really recommend people that have road rage to float <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah so um it's yeah it's it is definitely um something that we strive for as well and i'm really really happy to hear that in sydney that they, they're doing a very similar thing yeah, um, yeah instead of just banging them out you know instead of just floating someone oh, okay say bye you know, like it, it's, there's got to be a conversation. There's got to be a human interaction there. Yeah, and there's probably, I mean, there's probably a, a number of them that are out there that are probably a bit more churn and burn and, and meeting the demand to, you know, to obviously make a, make a few quick bucks. But um, I guess yeah. the, the longevity of those businesses versus other ones that are, that are taking a, a more genuine approach to it uh, would probably be significantly <clears throat> different. So it's, um, it's exciting because I think 
I think more people are talking about alternative ways of 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 healing and and developing themselves, and and it's not you know through sort of some crazy woo woo start uh, type stuff that in the past has probably been associated with with uh, you know some con tactics or it's something that involves a lot of money invested and, and whatnot. So um, I think the more that people talk, the the more opportunity, the more that people will probably be exposed to these sort of uh, these outlets. Yeah, I reckon. And the thing with the float tank is um, you can't really call it that woohoo because it was developed in the 50s. Mm. You know, like it's it's been used for, for many, many years. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, um, you know, for people, you know, it's had its, uh, the industry's had its ups and downs with, um, like any industry does. Mm. Um, it had a mis- you know, resurgence in the 80s and then it sort of died off. And then it's it's come back mm. with revengeance, and um and I, I really can only see the positive from that as long as um people have a really kind intention towards the people using it. Da- absolutely, and I think I think it's probably more important now than ever that people have an outlet or, or a resource like this that they can utilize with, as you said before, with social media, and I think just the the mentality that uh, we sort of pushed on each other, where we we expect everything very quickly. Um, if we're not happy with something, then we discard it straight away. Um, we're, as you said before, very reactive uh, nine times out of ten. So we sort of float through the day and then wonder, float through the day for lack of a better word, um, but get to the end of the day where you sort of forget what you've actually done and you've just been running on that autopilot for the entire day and you f- and then you yeah. wonder why you've got a ripping headache you wonder why you're not sleeping properly you wonder why you just feel lousy or you're agitated in a bad mood um and yeah it's just it's a very reactive culture that we live in so it's um it's probably more it's, it's a lot of pressure beneficial. so much pressure yeah you know like there's pressure to be something that you're not already <laughs> you know there's pressure there's some um, inherent anxiety to um to try and you know to try and be accepted, to try and, um, but, but really, um, floating to me has really made me realize oh, I'm actually a pretty good dude, you know? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and all, all the things that I'm, I'm heading towards are actually, um, all positive, you know? Yeah. All good directions. Yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. Def- definitely a lot of pressure, especially when you've got so many outlets of public displays of of what you're up to you know, via your phone so all the different social media platforms and there's there's definitely i i can still see it increasing where people are making a big push to try and show everyone how good they are or what they're up to and and trying to portray a certain image to other people of what they are that might not even be reality anyway but it's it's sort of trying to measure up to other people, and you see other everyone else on social media doing things, and you only see a snapshot of their life. You don't see their everyday uh, comings and goings. But um, I think it, just seeing seeing the way that everyone interacts with each other, it, there's just that underlying pressure that you said before, where I think everyone's just trying to measure up against each other. I've been there myself. Mm. You know, like um, I remember when I was a raging guitar player, and. Um, <laughs> I still am. I still love playing guitar, man. But I got caught up in this whole illusion of like, oh, I want to be better than that guy. Yeah. Oh, I've got to be faster than him. You know, I've got to be, I've got to be way faster than that guy. Come on. You know, I've put myself under this amazing stress. Yeah. And for what? Mm. You know what I mean? And so now, like, when I pick up the instrument, I feel like I'm doing it for a more honest reason now. Mm. You know, like, I'm not trying to hold up, you know, this stupid illusion of trying to be the best, you know? Absolutely. <laughs> but, um, yeah, and then that comes into other things as well, of like trying other instruments. You know, you start playing with different things, and um, which is super important for your creative output. Mm. Um, instead of pigeonholing yourself, putting yourself in a box that just, you know, which we all do. We all put ourselves in a box, and then we're inherently stressed out about being in the box. <laughs> so, it's, um, it's a vicious yeah, cycle. I've just been trying to dissolve it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Are, are you still. I mean, you said that you still pick up the guitar, but are you still are you still doing music? Are you still playing in in, in the band? Are you still uh, is the band still going? Dissolution. Well, the band is such as um like it's still we still have an album that's recorded and that's ready to sort of um to release, but we we sort of lost our drummer, which is my brother. Okay. Um, which we all seem to have drummer issues, right? Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah absolutely. Uh, <laughs> 
Yeah. Um, and, you know, life, you know, takes us different directions and um, essentially that's what what happened. So it's mm. more of a hiatus at the moment. Yeah. Um, so I'm still in good contact with Courtney and uh, Brett. Mm. So we still um, hang out and we're still good friends and we'll still make music together. And But essentially I'm not in a band at the moment, but I'm just jamming with lots of different people, different instruments, different, you know, like just really having fun with it. Eh? And that's, and that's kind of cool because I'm no doubt just touching on what you said before, there's probably not that pressure that we, you have to desperately try and find someone to get the band moving again and, and, and you know, you said you've got a, an album recorded. I think I'm, I'm assuming, and I'm probably just speaking on behalf of you, but I assume that uh, there's there's a there's peace in the fact that you can come back to it at any stage, and when the time's right and when the pieces exactly. fall into place, then then you then you can you can take that next step. But there's no there's no pressure to try and rush something and try and get something out, and you know, and and the the worry that everything's falling apart. It's just that you know the time's not right, and when those opportunities pop up, then then you can obviously seize them and go from there. Yeah, no, definitely, I, I definitely felt like. Um um, like the old mentality I used to have was like, oh, we're going to get this done. Oh, let's get it done. Let's get a drummer. And then now I'm like, it'll happen in good time. You know, like we'll definitely find someone that suits the, you know, suits the uh, mentality of the band and the, and the personalities mesh. And, and we've got that beautiful and amazing album that's mm. ready to go, yeah. which I'm really stoked about. And it's been mixed by a guy um, called uh, Seamus. <laughs> and he was, um, he used to live in Christchurch. Yep. And he played in a band called uh, Zest Iron. Okay. And um, fantastic musician and um, really great at mixing as well. So um, essentially, um, it's all been done. It's ready to rock. And it's just about finding that right person, the right moment in each other's life. And then we'll be back to it, you know? That's cool. I, I, like, I love the idea that there's, you, you've got it. You've got that, that music there. It's, it's ready to go. You've, you've put all the, the blood, sweat, and tears into into that, and you've gone through that process already, and you're sitting on it. So it's almost like you, you're sitting on the on on the gold mine, so to speak. You've got your your asset there, and it's it's ready to go, and and you can just unleash it whenever whenever it feels right for for you guys. So that's that's really cool because I think uh, for other people, it might if you you need that person in the band to then start going through and putting the ideas. Uh, down and recording them, then it might be a slightly different scenario. But um, yeah, that's awesome to know that uh, that it's just sitting there waiting to go. Yeah, and I'm super proud of it. We all are. We're so proud of it. Um, it's definitely a huge step forward from the first album. Still has that uh, thrashy element and the, the melody and so forth, but there's some stuff in there that you know it's I find to be quite groundbreaking for us. That's very cool. cool. And has. Um with with the band itself and and writing and whatnot uh what what elements are you bringing to that writing process have you have you gone from a musical point of view or do you do you also add uh lyrics or is that some of the other guys that contribute towards that side of it um so with the music side of it uh i'm pretty big into writing a lot of riffs and uh, arrangements yep. and uh this album this album the first album was mainly me and uh brett Yep. So Brett would do all the all the vocal, all the uh, lyrical melodies and all the lyrics and so forth. And um, I would throw in riffs. He'd have a couple of guitarists in there as well. Mm-hmm. And um, and essentially, I wrote most of that in the first album. But on the second album, uh, me and Courtney, the second guitar player, we just absolutely gel mm-hmm. uh, when we create. And um, we were creating whole songs and just throwing them at each other. And it was just fantastic how we've been, our styles just melded together beautifully. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's why I'm probably so proud of that album is that there's been a collaboration of uh, the, you know, the three of us mm. to really nail it down. Yeah. Do you think that that writing, because I'm not sure how, how long ago you, you wrote you wrote the album, but has the, the change in your lifestyle and I guess the, the different perspectives that you've been able to obtain in the last, say, three years, has that had a, an impact of how you've approached the band with with writing and, and gelling with with uh, with with the other guys? Well, I feel I feel that I actually am way more open to ideas. Yeah. So um, I used to be super rigid about um, what I thought, and that's a good thing mm. in certain ways. Mm. Um, of like having a certain foresight and like, nah, that's, this is the way it should be. But now I feel like I'm way more open to taking on someone's um, creative output that's brilliant 
it's like uh, actually realizing other people's creative talent has been a, um, a huge shift in my mentality. Mm. So um, noticing that just Courtney's super talented guy mm. um, and so underrated like um, as a musician. Uh, he has an amazing ear for things. And um, we just sort of um, went writing. It, you know how it all just perfectly gels. Yeah. And I don't think I, with my mentality, like three years, like, because it has been the last three years that things have shifted a lot for me. Mm. And um, with the guys now, I can just be myself. I can just throw it all out there. And then they're like, oh, that was pretty, that was fucking cool. I yeah. like that. That was good. But um, <laughs> beforehand, yeah, it was, um, I definitely had the blinkers on and couldn't see the creative elements of uh, so other people's input. So now you. So yeah, I reckon the last yeah, I just really accept um, how great other people can be as well. That's it. Just <laughs> Whereas, ma- just making the most of, of other people's talents. Yeah, and just um, it's just it's like on canvas, right? You just add in a few more colours and a few more brush strokes, mm-hmm. and it's it's definitely beneficial for everything in life. Collaborating with someone else. That's awesome. I, I'm you, you're talking up the album without even telling me what it's going to sound like or anything like that. I just like the <laughs> I like the approach mentally that you guys have taken towards it. So uh, when it when it eventually sees light of day, I'll I'll be I'll be stoked to to check it out. So uh, we'll we'll have to yeah, man. You'll be the first later. one to get a copy, mate. <laughs> oh, awesome. <laughs> yeah. Um, one last thing because I'm just keeping you on time, and I know uh, know you're quite busy, but. Um, one last thing that you, I've noticed and I've been uh, spending a bit of time reading is uh, you've got a blog, um, yes. me- Mental Phase. So I was having a look at that and you've you've also got a Facebook page for it as well. So I'll give a link to everyone that they can check out. But um, what was the what was the purpose behind the blog? What was um, was there some inspiration initially to write to write out your thoughts and and experiences? Uh, where did that come from? And I guess where is there any plans to to Push it in a particular direction, or is it something that you're just going to touch on whenever you whenever you have a chance? Yeah, well, um, where it sort of gave birth was um, when I was in Victoria, and I sort of noticed this sort of deep depression sort of come in. I was like, "What is this? This is weird." And I actually eventually found out it's vitamin D <laughs> deficiency, right? And also, also a lot to do with um, a lot to do with sort of being away from home. Mm. So shredding that illusion of myself. Um, and I felt that writing about these things and my experiences were, was medicine as, as a whole. And um, for me, that whole blog is just being real and authentic. You know, there's no, there's no filters on that. It is just being real as possible. And you can take it and leave it as you like. Mm. But um, that's, that's how I see the, the world as a, as a lens now. Mm. And I think we need more people to actually just jump out of that social confine of um, worrying about what everyone else thinks of you mm. and just be real. Yeah. Just be real, you know? It's, so that's uh, my big thing for that. That's cool because I, I was reading through it and there's a lot of things that you were writing there. It's like, oh, absolutely, like 100% agree or, I've, I've, yeah, being there, done that and and totally connected with, with a lot of things that you've written in there. And and I love the idea of, of – uh, of people documenting, whether it be for for public consumption or whether it's just for themselves, and, and no one else will ever read it. And it's just, I think the the process of getting something out, whether you whether you're physically writing something or you're typing something, but just writing out those thoughts, just appears to be so therapeutic, just to get them out of your mind. Especially when you know, going back to what we were saying before, with us dealing with so many different thoughts that are coming in and out of our minds and the distractions that we have all the time. It's, it's hard to even focus on one particular thing that might be pressing on your mind for a long period of time. So writing it out, you, you're almost getting that, um, that awareness in the moment, that mindfulness of, of, uh, of really sort of dissecting, dissecting the things that are going through your mind. Yeah. And I saw it, I saw it as like, I used a pen. So I used to write with the pen and um, I found a deeper connection with the flow, the flow state of just writing. Yeah. Um, and essentially floating helped me with that and and um, like releasing a lot more creativity and so forth when it comes to what I'm writing about yeah. is like just being honest as possible. And um, yeah, the thing is, is that those techniques, they all relate to each other, you know, and um, having that as medicine, man, like everyone can write stuff down. Um, 
but it's just about being honest enough about it that you don't care about what other people think. Yeah. Because the people that, you know, it's, it's that whole saying of your vibe, you know, attracts your tribe. <laughs> and if you're going to bring out an honest vibe, you're probably going to get a lot more honest people in your life. I like it. I like it. Absolutely. And um, I'll, yeah, I'm, going to put, I'm going to put a link for people to check that out because I think um, whether, whether whether you want to write something that's uh, that's out there in the public domain for people to read or whether it's something just for yourself in, in a notepad or, or in a journal or whatever it might be, um, hopefully what you've done will uh, will motivate a few people to, to pick up a pen and just start writing. And, and writing without, and I'm, I'm sure you can agree with it, is, you know, writing without a real sense of purpose initially anyway just writing just anything that's in your mind just just getting it out there and then and then obviously if you want to write a particular you know on a particular topic topic or a thought that you've that you've had then then so be it but um, not putting those restrictions or those rules on just just writing just just translating whatever's in your mind out into paper in front of you yeah we're always trying to control everything about of it about our experience hmm. And um, I, I'm, yeah, I'm much more an advocate for the flow state, you know, like just letting things come and actually come through you um, because it's way more honest, way more genuine. And it usually sounds seems better too when you create with music, you know. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> melodies soar, melodies soar, you know, counterpoints work better. Um, everything is great. Yeah, that's it's awesome. really cool. Oh, cool. Well, I'll... Um I'll put links for everyone to check out and uh, I might put some details so that people can reach out to you as well. But um, yeah, I'll, I'll, we'll wrap it up now, but thanks so much. I really appreciate it, man. And um, we'll have to, we'll have to do a round two or maybe I'll get over to Christchurch sometime too, sometime soon. And we'll, uh, we'll, uh, we'll do a, we'll do one with a, with a float involved. Yeah, mate. And I'll, I'll definitely do a little Sydney trip and um, maybe we can go catch a bird. <laughs> sounds good. Sounds good. Man. All right. Take care, man. Thanks, everyone. Hope you enjoyed that one. That was really cool. All the links will be on andysocial.net. Um, there will be a YouTube link to this conversation. So if there was anything of interest that you thought could be good for somebody you know, please use the YouTube link. Uh, that's all on andysocial.net or um, off the top of my head, it's youtube.com slash C slash Andy Dowling. I'm losing my voice. <coughs> Pardon me. Um I would encourage you guys to use the YouTube links if you want to pass anything on, even if it's a particular part of, of the conversation, not the entire thing. Uh, YouTube's so much better to pass on uh, these conversations to people, especially people who aren't aware of podcasts or don't have the attention span to listen to the entire thing. I'm losing my voice again. <coughs> I need a drink. Um, so, yeah, that'll all be online by the time you listen to this. Um, another massive thing that would be great is, uh, rating and reviewing on iTunes, um, or just getting onto Facebook and liking and sharing the pages and the posts that, uh, it definitely helps bring more awareness to the podcast and keeps this whole thing going. Um, as always, and I haven't mentioned this for a while, if anybody wants any discounts, uh, Andy social is the code word. Uh, and you can buy merchandise from our Lord store. So at the moment there's uh, Lord and Dungeon merchandise on their CDs, T-shirts, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. There's some uh, other music on there from uh, friends um, in India. There's uh, also music from Arnie, uh, who was previously on our podcast, is uh, sadly passed on, but um, his uh, memory is certainly there in, in the music that he's created. So that's all available on our online store which is lord.net.au slash store. And we're slowly uh, migrating all that over to Bandcamp in the near future as well. But uh, for the time being, that's uh, that's the easiest way to pick up stuff. And in the near future, there will be podcast-related merchandise as well uh, once I find uh, a spare bit of dough to, to invest. But uh, lots of cool stuff. And the code word andysocial.net will give you 10% off uh, anything in the store. And you can use it as many times as you want. So if you're smart, you'll write it down somewhere. And uh, as new things become available, you can just constantly get a discount. So anyway, that's about it. Uh, thank you so much. I don't even know what number episode this is. Potentially it's episode 50. So if it is, woohoo. <laughs> congratulations to myself but uh massive thank you to everyone that's tuned in so far and supported it the views or the listens continue to increase uh episode by episode 
Um, so I can definitely see that it's tracking in the right direction. And over time, the guests will become more and more varied. There's more and more people that I want to approach. Some people that normally or previously I probably would have thought were out of my league. Uh, but there's um, there's a lot of exciting things com- coming and hopefully off the back of the podcast, a lot of other cool uh, cool projects that will, will come out of it as well. But uh, thanks so much as always. Enough rambling. We'll speak soon. Ta-ta. You're ready. You're ready. So, so.